text this afternoon will be Lord's Day 1, the well-known words of Lord's Day 1. And in connection with that, I'd like to read firstly from the letter of Ephesians, the first letter of Ephesians chapter 1, the first 14 verses. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to follow along, or otherwise you can follow along on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read the first 14 verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. As I already mentioned, our text this afternoon will be Lord's Day 1 from the Heidelberg Catechism, and then specifically we'll be focusing on the first question and answer. Let's read Lord's Day 1 together. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. What do you need to know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? First, how great my sins and misery are. Second, how how I am delivered from all my sin and misery. And third, how I am to be thankful to God for such deliverance. So far from the Catechism this afternoon. Well, over the last couple of weeks or months since seminary has shut its doors for the summer break, I've had the opportunity to read some books that I wouldn't normally be reading. It's not that they're bad books, they're just not seminary books. And one of those books that I've really wanted to read is a book by Nabil Qureshi. Nabil Qureshi had a book and it's entitled, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And in that book, Nabil Qureshi, who is himself a a former Muslim and was raised in a Pakistani-American household, he details and shares the experience of converting from Islam to Christianity. And he did so when he read the Bible and began to debate his friend in school. And while he was detailing his childhood years as a Muslim... It was impressed on him by his father and his mother that he needed to understand, he needed to memorize, he needed to recite the Quran. In fact, he writes in his book these words. He says this, Muslims who recite the Quran regularly are regarded as pious, whereas Muslims who only contemplate the meaning of the Quran are regarded as learned. Piety, he says, is the greater honor. And most Muslims I know growing up could recite many chapters of the Quran for memory. 
His mother had in mind to teach us both recitation of the Quran and the translations, but recitation came first, he writes. Every day, as far back as I can remember, his mother would put a traditional Muslim skull cap on my head, sit me down beside her, and teach me to read Arabic. And by the time he turned six, he had finished reading the entire Quran, much to his mother's delight. And at the same time, his mother helped him to memorize some of the chapters in the Quran. His favorite, he writes in his book, was chapter 112. Why? Well, probably for reasons that we would expect. It was short, it was melodic, and it was easy to memorize. But not only was this passage his favorite, but it was also the favorite of Muhammad. For Muhammad writes that this was probably the most weighty, the most important chapter in the Quran. He said reading that one chapter, 112, is like reading a third of the Quran. And what was the message of that chapter 112? The message it says is this, Allah is not a father, and he has no sons. In fact, if you were to go through the Quran, Surah 518, chapter 518, the Quran tells the Muslim explicitly they are to rebuke the Jews and the Christians for calling God their father because humans are just things that God has created. You see, Muslims don't consider their relationship with Allah in a father-son relationship. Instead, they consider themselves servants of Allah. If you were to ask them, how do you describe your relationship with their God? They would say they were servants. And the question that I want to pose to you this afternoon is this. How would you describe your relationship with God? And lest you too easily gloss over the question, or lest you too easily jump to your feet and say, oh, it's simple, God is my father. I want you to consider this story from John Wesley. John Wesley was an 18th century theologian, and he was an evangelist in England. And when he was reflecting on his conversion, he answered a similar question as this, how do you describe your relationship to God? I listened to the story as summarized by John Stott, the story of John Wesley. Wesley and his friends visited the inmates of prisons and worked in houses in Oxford. They took pity on the slum children in the city, providing them with food, clothing, and education. They observed Saturdays as the Sabbath, as well as Sundays. They went to church and Holy Communion. They gave alms, searched the scriptures, fasted and prayed, but they were bound in the fetters of their own religion, he writes, for they were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. And a few years later, John Wesley, in his own words, came to trust in Christ, in Christ only for his salvation, and was given an inward assurance of this. And after this, looking back to his pre-conversion experience, this is what John Wesley wrote. He said, I had even the faith of a servant, but not that of a son. Christianity, he says, is a religion of sons, not slaves. And moving from the 18th century to today again, the the question is this, how would you describe your relationship with God, a slave or a son? And if I reflect on that question myself, and perhaps as you reflect on this question, you might realize sooner rather than later that you probably have a somewhat servant mindset. Let me relate how this experience is in my own life, and perhaps it might relate in yours. Consider these two different days or these two different seasons of my life. One day I get up early. It's a good day for me. The alarm goes off and I'm up and at it. I quickly get up. I spend some profitable and quiet time reading God's word. I'm in devotion. I'm in prayer. Perhaps I spend even longer than usual in prayer. And generally after that, my day seems to go generally well. Things fall into place. I have a sense that God is with me. But consider a second day. 
The alarm goes off in the morning and I don't arise as I should. The snooze button's all too convenient on my alarm clock. And soon, I go back to sleep again. And finally, when I wake up, it's too late. I run downstairs, put your clothes on, get ready for work, and off you go out the door. I skip my morning devotions. I haven't spent time in prayer as I should have been. And as I go about my day, I begin feeling guilty, guilty of missing my quiet time, and everything in the day just seems to go wrong. I become more and more irritable as the day goes on, and somehow I feel that God is not with me. Now, perhaps you've had times like that in your own life. And what this shows to us is that we feel that God blesses us when we do something good. Somehow God's blessing rests on our spiritual performance. And if you have that way of thinking, as I sometimes do, then we're relating to God in a servant mindset. I do, and then God gives back because of what I do. But what we want to realize this afternoon is that servant mindset doesn't give us hope. If the greatest sort of source of comfort for me rests in my performance, then surely that's of little value. Some days my spiritual life is on a high, and before I know it, I'm struggling again in the downs. Sometimes I feel close to God, and other times I feel very distant. No, this servant mentality that we have cannot be our greatest source of comfort. A greatest comfort that needs to be founded on something and on someone greater than my ourselves. And that truth that the Quran speaks against, namely God is our Father, and that truth which, which Wesley came to realize later on, namely that we are children of God, that comes straight from Scripture. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, it says this, So you are no longer a slave, but you are God's child, and since you are God's child, He has also made you an heir. And it's that same idea which causes the Apostle Paul to break forth in, in exceeding praise. He says in 1 John 3, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And dear loved ones, this afternoon I want to focus on that great love of God. That great love, namely that we are God's children and God is our Heavenly Father. I want to concentrate on that, that wonderful privilege that we have of being adopted into God's family. And this privilege of being adopted into God's family is perhaps the most glorious privilege that we can share. And in fact, it is the greatest, the riches, the most profound joy that we can experience. Unless you think that I'm overestimating and, and exaggerating the case, listen to what the late J.I. Packer wrote in his book, Knowing God. Listen to this claim that he says. Adoption, he says, is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. Adoption is a family idea conceived in terms of love and viewing God as a father. In adoption, God takes us into his family and fellowship and he established us as his children and heirs. Closeness, affection, and generosity as at the heart of this relationship with God. And then he says this, to be right with God the judge is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is far greater, he writes. Far greater. And our spiritual adoption, that God is our Father and we are God's children... That's the richest blessing because it comes, it brings us from courtroom language into family language. Our greatest comfort, your greatest comfort in life and in death, the richest blessing which we can enjoy is that we are adopted into God's family. You are a child of God and God is your father. And for the remainder of our time this afternoon, I want to focus on that truth together through the lens of Lord's Day 1. And I want to use this as a theme. My adoption is my greatest comfort. There's four truths I want to look at. Firstly, I belong to Jesus Christ. Secondly, I am purchased. Thirdly, I am preserved. And fourthly, I am promised. My adoption is my greatest comfort. Four, four ideas I want to look at. I belong to Jesus Christ. 
I am purchased, I am preserved, and I am promised. The very first question, the Heidelberg question, the very first question that the Heidelberg Catechism asks us and confronts us with is the idea of comfort. It says, what is your only comfort in life and in death? What's your only comfort that's suitable for all occasions, at all times? Well, the first paragraph of the catechism, the first answer that the catechism gives is this, that I'm not my own, it says, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Your greatest comfort is this, that you belong to Jesus Christ, your body and your soul, in life and in death, you belong to Jesus Christ. And it's a claim that's echoed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. And that means that we're no longer slaves to the devil, we're no longer slaves to sin, and we're no longer slaves to ourselves even. Instead, we belong to another. We've been adopted into God's family. We belong to Jesus Christ. And this idea of belonging to somebody else is, is adoption language. And as we read the first part of the catechism's answer, we can hear a, an echo of what we read from Ephesians 1. We hear that drumbeat that opens through these verses in Ephesians. I am in Christ. Ten times in the 14 verses that we read, ten times we read the words that we are in Christ. We belong to a faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And verses 4 and 5 say that. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, in love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. Did you hear that? God adopted us in Christ, it says, before the foundation of the world. Before anything was made, you were adopted. Before God placed the sun in the sky, you were adopted in love by God the Father. Before the stars were thrown into space, God chose you as his child. Before the mountains were formed, God set his love upon you. Before he filled the seas with water, he knew you by name. God had his sight set on your soul. And I hope the conception of, of, of adoption is not foreign among you. I'm sure there's some of you that have either been adopted yourself or have adopted children. My wife and I have experienced the blessings of, of adoption personally. We've given, been given two children. And I think the analogy of physical adoption is, is helpful for us to understand the spiritual adoption. When my wife and I decided to adopt, uh, pursue adoption for ourselves, God had chosen His wisdom not to open the door for biological children. He, in his wisdom, instead directed our lives wonderfully so that we could, through adoption, have a family of two children. And families who choose to adopt make that decision long before the child is born. Adoption, you see, is the initiative of parents, not the children. It wasn't the children's idea, but rather the idea of the parents. The children had no idea what was happening at that time. Our children didn't pursue us, but as parents, we pursued them. And that physical reality, it mirrors the spiritual reality. Just like we decided as parents to adopt our children, so God the Father had decided in an eternity past to adopt you. He purposed to give you an eternal inheritance, life in His presence forever. Our spiritual adoption was not our incentive. It was not our initiative. It wasn't our choice. It wasn't our doing. It was God, our Father, and Him alone. It was God's initiative. And God calls you by name. And God declares to you, you belong to me. Beloved, your greatest comfort is not based on what you do. 
but rather it's based on who you are. It's not based on what we do, but who we are. You are children of God, well-loved children of God. And that means that my body and my soul, my life and my death, every facet of my life belongs to Jesus Christ because I am a child of God. The second paragraph we want to have a look at tells us that we are purchased, which is the second point. As many of you will know, children come at a cost. And adopted children are no less different than that. Be it financial or be it emotional or whatever the case may be, children cost money. And that was even more so in ancient times where children had to be bought. Adopted children were bought into the family. And children, biological or adopted, they're loved the moment we lay eyes on them. In fact, you could also say that we loved our children before we laid eyes on them. In our situation, when we met our children for the first time, the moment that we saw them on the lounge floor, the moment that they sucked our toes, the moment that we saw them sleeping in the crib for the first time, our love for our children was full and unconditional. Our love for our children was totally unmerited. They had nothing good or bad to merit that love. And now when they disappoint us, as all children do, we remind our children, and you remind your children, that our love for our children is not based on what they do, but rather who they are. They are your children. And now as a result of our adoption, our children have taken on our family name. Legally, they belong to us. And in the second paragraph of the answer that's given in question and answer one of the Heidelberg Catechism, we acknowledge that God purchased us while we were slaves to another. It says in the Lord's Day, the second paragraph, He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. God has set us free from an evil taskmaster. We have been set free from sin. And now we've become slaves of God. God, through his precious son, Jesus Christ, has freed us from the power of sin and the devil. It's Christ, through his blood, has redeemed us from sin. And now we are innocent. We are acquitted. We are righteous. We are blameless before God. And all that wording of blameless and innocent is courtroom language. God pronounces us not guilty, justified. Jesus Christ has paid the price to redeem us. We see that also echoed in in uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. It says there, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by washing of the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus Christ, it's Him alone who saves us. We read together from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 has that same truth. Verse 7 says this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, forgiveness of our trespasses. We have redemption. We have deliverance. We have release from our sins. And all this is accomplished, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. God sent his only son to redeem us. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, gave up his life willingly so that we might belong to him. Do you understand, the? can you see the immense value that God places on you? That God would come down and die for you. You are valued. You are valued as sons and daughters of the living God. And it would have been extraordinary, wouldn't it, if God had simply forgiven us and declared us righteous. That would have been remarkable. To be right with God is a great thing. But God doesn't just stop there by making us right. God, as, as it were, comes off the judgment chair And comes as a family and a father and he adopts us to be his children. And so that changes how we think, doesn't it? 
We are no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to the devil. We're no longer slaves to ourselves anymore. We don't dance to that music. We don't listen to the beat of that drum anymore. But instead, we live for God. And our hearts and our minds are in tune to what God wants us to do. We also recognize from this truth that sin does not alienate us from God's love permanently. Nothing can separate us from God's love as we read in Romans 8 verse 28. Christ died that we might be accepted by God. No, our sins won't alienate us from God's love. Why? Because God chose you in eternity past knowing that you are a sinful person, knowing your sins and your shortcomings, knowing my sins and my weaknesses. God loved you. Knowing that you in advance were a sinner and knowing in advance that you would continue to stumble and fall. But God, Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. Beloved, your only comfort is not based on what you have done, but it's rather based on what Christ has done for you. So don't despair when you struggle and sin. Don't despair when you fall time and time again. Don't throw up your hands and say, God can't love me anymore because of my sins. Because God loves you despite your sins. God chose you to be his child. Don't think that God no longer loves you because you wrestle with sin. No, you belong to Jesus Christ. He knows your failings. Christ Jesus has paid the price for your sins. He's bought you to be his own possession. He chose you despite your weaknesses. So when you stumble and fall, turn again in repentance to your humble Savior. Plead for his forgiveness of your sins and live lives of obedience for what he has done for you. The third paragraph in the Heidelberg Catechism gives us our third point. I am preserved. It says there, he also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. And this third paragraph of the Heidelberg Catechism, this third, the third paragraph of the first answer, it demonstrates a reality that's far greater than just being right with God. Even more than being right with God is that God loves us and God cares for us. And that love and the care by God is, is family language, not courtroom language. The courtroom language has been transferred into, into family language. The God who is a judge is also God as our father. And he pronounces as a father, he loves you. And that he's going to care for you. And that he wants to be with you. That's also true in regard to the adoption of our children. Our love and our care for our two children, it's as great as anyone could ever imagine. But you see, adoption was not just a legal process, that once they came into our care, that everything was done. No, adoption of our children includes the fact that we have the privilege and the honor and the responsibility of, of caring for them and supporting them and encouraging them and, and correcting them and loving them. And why? Well, we do all that because we love them. We have their best interest at heart. And we love our children not because of what they've done, but because of who they are. And likewise, dear friends, we are loved and cared for by Almighty God. God promises that He will do the small things. The Catechism talks about the hairs on our head are known by God. God will do the small things for us. But God will also do the, does the great things. He sent his son to die for you. It's what we confess in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he, know, how will he not with him graciously give us all things? And that truth, that truth that God loves you and cares for you, it affects the way we think. We trust that the Father's plans for us and our life is good. The Father cares for us. He knows us. He's valued us. He's, the Son died for us. And Father will work out all things for our good. And God is powerful enough to care for the big things by securing our salvation through the death of Christ. What more could He have done for you? What more could He have done for me apart from sending His Son? And yet we also believe that God is caring enough to, to control the smallest things in our life. The pairs on my head, the places that I go, and the people that I meet on the road. When I was considering the, the, the example of how big and the big things that God does and the small things that God cares for, I came across an analogy. And back in 2017, there was a painting that was sold on the market, a painting that was sold by, um, painted by Leonardo da Vinci. And that painting sold for $450 million. I'm not sure how a painting can be worth that much, but it was. $450 million for a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. And you can bet your bottom dollar that whoever purchased that painting for $450 million won't leave it lying in the corner on the ground. He did the big things of securing a painting. I'm sure he'll make sure the painting sits nicely on a wall and is straight and dusted properly. And in the same way, God did the great things for us by sending his son. And so confident should we be that he will also look after the smallest things in our lives, even the hairs on our head. Beloved, your comfort is not only that Christ purchased you at such a great price, but also that Christ cares for you. And the fourth section of the Heidelberg Catechism gives us our fourth point, I am promised. A 17th century English Puritan, he wrote this. His name was Stephen Charnock. He said, adoption gives us the privilege of sons. Regeneration gives us the nature of sons. Adoption, he says, gives us the privilege of sons. Regeneration gives us the nature of sons. And that's the truth that we confess in the last part of this catechism. Not only do we receive the status of being God's children, we're also given the nature of being God's children through the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. It says in the catechism, Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Already now in this life, we can begin to live as God's children. Already in this life, we can and will experience some of the perfections in this, sorry, we will experience in perfection what we'll, sorry. We will, we begin in this life to experience what we will experience in the future in, in perfection. You see, we are able now already through the working of the Spirit, we are able to live as God's children and we desire to. We want to live as God's children according to all of God's commandments. And we have already now a small beginning of that obedience. And that's also true for our children. Now that our children have our name, now that our children are in our care, they start to do the things that we want them to do. They start singing the songs that we want to sing. And they start saying the things that we like to say. You see, they begin to follow our commands slowly and slowly as they transform into our children. And this final section, we make this beautiful confession, this, this beautiful promise that we as God's children have an inheritance in store for us. We have a future that awaits us. That is the riches of God's grace which He lavishes upon us. And verse 14 of the words that we read from Ephesians tell us that truth. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. You see, the Holy Spirit assures us that we have an eternal inheritance, eternal life, awaiting for us as children. 
and we begin to live for Christ both now and into, into forever. We have a comfort in life and in death for our, both our body and our soul that we are children of God. Children of God. Having God as your Father, it ought to control the way we pray. It ought to control the way that we worship God. It ought to change our outlook on life. The richest blessing, the highest privilege that we receive is being called God's children. And it should provide us with the greatest comfort that we have in all our times of need, even in life and even in death. Already now we are God's children. And one day when we do go through the portal of death, we still remain God's children and we enter into God's eternal presence forever. Wonder, marvel at God's grace that he has adopted you into his family. Contemplate that privilege that J.I. Packer says is the greatest privilege that we enjoy. Let me close with the words of this old hymn. Tis not I that did choose thee, for Lord, that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee had thou not chosen me. Thou from sin that stained me has cleansed me and set me free of all thou hast ordained that I should live for thee. Amen.